Oh, that, that makes me so happy. I'm like when you when you message me saying like, okay, let's do an interview. Like it truly like made my day. Like I've been wanting to talk to you forever. Um, I guess I'll just start off by saying, you know, you were. I mean, and I don't know how often you hear this, but you were the very first person I saw uh, either on television or in the real world that showed me actually how I could possibly be in the world, what I could be. You were the first person I was able to relate to um, just by watching your behavior. Um, you know, I want to get into like watching you on like AOL or Prodigy, you know, like in the, they had that like big <laughs> computer, but just in general, you know, Thank you for that. And do you have you heard that a lot? Like, do you still hear that today? I do. And it's just the most incredible thing to even think about. You know, I have um, I'm even friends with some of the kids that were at the after school program that we worked with in Boston. And to hear their perspective when they were only like 12 or 13 years old at the time is just like the most amazing thing to experience, you know, 25 years later um, and to still hear that. I don't know. It's just, it's a privilege. It's such an honor to be told something like that and to really understand the weight, I guess, of the responsibility of trying to be a positive role model for people, um, which I think when you're in your early twenties and you're doing reality TV in the first place, you don't really keep that in mind, <laughs> you know? So I wish I would have maybe known more then than what I know now in terms of, um, just the, the, the gravity of it all. Wait, I you're still really in touch. Understand. You're still in touch with some of the kids from the after school scanner? One of them actually is a lesbian fiction writer. <laughs> yeah, she's great. And it turns out there's a few of my former cast members, like Cyrus is still in touch with some of the moms and he keeps up with the kids and what they're doing and where they went to college and stuff like, like that. So it's been really cool. So I want to go back. I mean, we all know you grew up in Gulfport, Mississippi. What was your life like pre the real world like were you a fan of the show like what did your life like how old were you when you came out I don't even know if the show really talked about that like what was your universe like so I came out of the closet while I was a senior in high school so I was around 17 years old and uh I had just gotten my first girlfriend uh I met her at work so I had just come out of the closet at 17 it was not an easy thing <laughs> you're not I wasn't just raised I was raised by my grandparents so you're talking about not your parents but a whole other generation removed so it was difficult for them to go through a very strict southern baptist family so everybody had a very difficult time with it and I was living with my girlfriend at the time when I was 19 which is when I was watching real world Miami and it was I think maybe only the second time I had ever seen the real world but when I was watching it, I don't know. I just thought I'm going to apply to this show and I'm going to be on this show. And my girlfriend, she was like, what? And I'm like, no, I'm serious. Like I'm going to apply to the show for the next season in Boston and I'm going to be on this show. And it was like, I don't know if I just like manifested it or what, but that's just how it ended up happening. Why did you want to be on the show? I think I just wanted to shake my world up you know, what better way to do that than apply to be on a reality show, I suppose. But I wanted to have an experience in a different city. I wanted to experience a different culture. Um, I had never really been on my own before, so to speak, because I basically moved out of, basically moved out of my house and, and was my girlfriend. I didn't have any type of, I guess, life experience just going out on my own and trying to figure out who I am, you know, on my own. So I thought that would probably be a good experience. And it just looked fun. Like everybody just looked like they were having a good time. I was going to get to meet new people. Um, sort of like moving into a college dorm, but different, you know, in terms of being thrown into a mix with total strangers and, you know, learning how to connect with people and understand people. Did you, um, did you and go, I just thought that that show. Did you go back and watch earlier seasons or had you truly only seen Miami? I remember vaguely seeing New York a couple of times years previously, but I didn't really watch a whole lot of MTV until Miami. And I don't even think I saw the full season of Miami. I think I just saw, I just happened to catch the few episodes where it says, are you interested in being on this show? Send a videotape of yourself. So I just thought maybe it was meant to be. 
<laughs> so I just, that's what I ended up doing. But once during the casting process, I really think I really bothered to go back and watch. I didn't want it to taint my view of what I might be experiencing. I mean, I wanted it to be fresh and new and I didn't want any preconceived expectations or ideas of what the whole thing was going to be about. And, uh, and I really haven't even watched any seasons after my season. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. What, so you didn't even keep up with the show after you were done? Nope. I didn't even keep my own. Back then, we were VHS tapes. So we used to get VHS tapes of ourselves. I didn't even keep that. I've never even seen my own season past when it aired. I just bounced out. I just, I don't know. I just <laughs> moved on, I suppose. Or maybe once you go through it and you see how much editing and how much manipulation can happen during the process, you, I sort of just, I didn't, I lost my jazz for the whole thing. I just didn't care anymore after we were done. Before we get into the editing and the manipulation, which I want to go deep on that, <laughs> I want to hear more about, okay, so how did you, so you see the ad, you know, want to be on the real world. What was your audition tape? And, and also like the process, like the casting process. I think I remember the first part was sending in a videotape of yourself, right? For like 15 minutes, you're just basically, they want to see you on camera. They want to know, just telling you about yourself. So for me, I'm like, hi, I'm, I'm uh, in my first year of college. I'm 19 years old. I'm out. I live with my girlfriend. You know, this is my life. My year. Um, and I don't remember basically saying too much past that. So when they get the videotapes, they watch them all. And then I think from there, they just start the calling process where then they sent me like, I could swear, I think it was like 20 page application of all these like essay questions. Like, tell us about yourself, tell us about your childhood. What's your favorite foods? What's the most, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? What do you see for yourself in 10 years from now? Like this, it's almost like a psychological profile that you fill out on yourself. And they take a look at that. And then from that, it just keeps going from step to step. Then it's a phone interview. And then it's a conference call with a bunch of other casting directors. And then they ended up flying me out to Los Angeles to do an in-person interview. And then when you go from there, then they also hire a local camera crew wherever you're living. And they, they hire them to follow you around for a night to see how you actually act on camera. And if you're, you know, if you're natural, if you're not natural, if you're, you know, going to be yourself or not um, just to do a little test drive and I think I remember the process being something like six months long like it was just a long process to go through because it's like several weeks in between each step and why were you so certain that they were going to cast you I don't even know if I was certain I just felt like it was meant to be for my life at that time I don't know if that makes any sense like I didn't think that I'd I'm still shocked that they picked me over all the other people that they could have picked. Um, but I just somehow knew that that was going to be like, a, there was going to be a phase in my life. I just somehow knew. And one of my friends, when I got casted, she's like, I was there that day that you told your girlfriend at the time, like, Oh, this show I'm going to apply and I'm going to be on this show. And she's like, and I knew at that moment that you were probably going to get cast. Cause there was something about it. Like I just inherently knew that it was going to be one of the phases of my life was to be on this reality show. I started off by saying like how uh, formative you were and your presence on the show was. What was super formative for you? Like, how did you, I guess, like realize you were gay? What were, like, were you into like independent film? Like, what was the culture that you were consuming watching you and helped inform your identity? I listened to, I was really, really into uh Melissa Etheridge at the time, mm -hmm. really, really into it. I, I I had heard the rumor mill that Ellen DeGeneres was um, gay as well, but she hadn't come out on her show yet. So I didn't know for sure, but I really, really like looked up to her and so respected her. I didn't really know any other gay people other than my girlfriend at the time. So it was really her who brought me to my first gay club and introduced me to like all of her gay friends because I didn't know anybody in high school. And if, I mean, there are plenty of people that come out of the closet later yeah. from my high school that I'm friends with now. But at the time I was like the black sheep, I was the only one. So I really depended on her um, at that time a lot in order to try to help me navigate through this whole new world that I was experiencing. Um, Cause I never experienced anything like it. Like I went to my gay, I went to my first gay bar and I was like, oh my gosh, everybody here is like happy and everybody's comfortable around each other. And it's okay for, you know the girls to dance with each other the boys to dance with each other. Like it's, I'd never seen it like that before because I was raised in a church basically. Do you recall if you were on like AO was it like America Online or Prodigy like the the chat room that you were in where you were like looking for 
other gay people and you were I mean Jesus Christ were you ahead of your time with like <laughs> you were looking for trans people to meet in Boston what service do you remember like if it was AOL prodigy what it was I don't remember I know it wasn't AOL I can tell you that for sure because I did I wasn't exposed to AOL until after I had come back home and got uh, my own computer and I, I don't remember what it was that they had us on there it was so bare bones whatever it was but I mean you know we're talking about the internet like 1996 or 97 it was like nothing going on at that time but uh yeah the chat rooms are great I just can't remember what the service was How, like I so related like that was me I mean I wound up meeting people you know through AOL chat rooms like that I really I truly saw myself in your behavior like that's sort of what I was referring to um so it just made me feel like oh my god like maybe there's a chance for me or there's got to be somebody else that's like kind of like me out there and it really was through seeing you um how were you how were you exposed to like drag culture and trans people in Gulfport, Mississippi at that time. There used to be a drag show at our local gay bar every single Friday night. And my girlfriend at the time, she's like, yeah, it's going to be so much fun. You're going to love this. If you can stay awake. Cause it was always at midnight, like on Friday nights. And I'm like, oh, I can totally stay awake. So I went to my first uh, drag show and I was like, oh my God, this is so much fun. They're beautiful. You know, they're feminine. They have the hair and the makeup. They're just having a good time with all of the music. And we just went regularly. And I ended up making really close friends with one of the um the, basically the MC of the drag show that used to be at the bar. I just gravitated. I think it was just so much, it was just fun and lively and everybody was so happy and having a good time. And it was amazing watching anybody be uninhibited on a stage like that, doing anything. It doesn't even matter what it is. Um, that one, as soon as I got to Boston, man, I just had to find like my tribe and find my <laughs> drag queens. Um, okay, so you're thrown into this house. How was this firehouse set up? Like, where was production? Because I know they like tend to take an entire floor of the house. So in the late, can, in, they were in the basement. Okay. Yes. And yep. who was your remind me who your roommate was? So I shared a room with Jason and Cyrus. How was that in reality? Great, great. Yeah, it was really great. I didn't even realize at the time that apparently that was the first co-ed roommate situation they'd ever had. Because the way the house was set up, it was supposed to be, there were three beds in one room for the three boys. And then there were two other bedrooms with two beds each because there were four girls. And so when I walked into the house and I ended up meeting Jason and Cyrus first, and we got along so fantastically, I just thought, I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable because I was still of that mentality where I'm going to not be able to come out of the closet for a little while. I didn't want to end up making one of the girls uncomfortable that I happened to be rooming with because that actually happened to me when I was in college. I ended up having a girl who didn't want to room with me anymore once she found out that I was gay. And I didn't want to go through that again. So the three of us are just like, yeah, we're just going to room together and just take this first room. And I guess that had not ever happened before mixing, you know, the girls with the boys at the time, but it was great. I mean, Cyrus was never around anyway. Dude was like, come strolling through at like four o'clock in the morning, you know? So it was, he was almost like a non-roommate when it comes to anybody staying in the room. And Jason and I would just drink and smoke and talk about life. It was great. I was re-watching, uh, cause I knew I was going to be chatting with you. So Bo the Boston season is not available on streaming everywhere. Like MTV is very, it has it um, like the first few seasons are on Paramount plus, And then the bulk of the series is like not available for streaming, but your season is actually somebody like ripped it off a of VHS tape. It's in a playlist on some like daily motion channel. So really? yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was rewatching some episodes and number one, I was struck by, I mean, where I was reminded, I mean, boy, were you all smokers. Like, it's so interesting. It's like, it's like a scene out of Reality Bites. Like, you're all just like Janine Garofalo, <laughs> like Jason oh. the Poet, like, it's all emo. It, it, it's such a snapshot of time. Montana. Are you, are you still in touch with Montana? Yes, yes. We just had brunch not too long ago. What yeah. is going on with her? She is, Montana is like just one of the coolest people. She's just very wise and she's very, she's a good person to talk to, like anything. She's very grounded and she's just got a really good outlook on life. And she is a, a single mom. She has two daughters 
and she uh, owns a uh, business. She does pretty much all holistic anything. You need acupuncture, you can get it from her. You want Reiki, you can get it from her. Like she's just really into the holistic uh, wellness scene uh, and she's really good at it too. The incident where Montana got in trouble for drinking at the daycare center, was that real? She got in trouble for giving one of the kids a sip of her alcohol. That's that's, even, that's actually even worse than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. What was going on? Like, why did she do that? I don't know. I don't even think she thought twice about it. We were at an event and they were drinking, they were drinking wine. I don't even think I was at that event. And one of the kids was like, I, can I have a sip of that? Or I want to smell it. And maybe she was of the mentality. Like my mom used to do that with me sometimes. I'd be like, I want a sip of that beer. And she'd go, you think you do, but you're not going to like it. And she'd give me a sip. And that would be like the end of it. Maybe Montana was thinking that at that moment, like, you don't really want a sip of this. I'm going to try, you know, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to warn you. Then it just ended up getting out that she, <laughs> I think that, I don't even remember how old like, the kid was, but I'm, you know, the parents were obviously livid. And she got fired and it was part of our contract that we had to work at a nonprofit. So she either was going to have to go home or she was going to have to become a volunteer for a completely different nonprofit, which is what she ended up doing. The, so it was, it was during your season that you mentioned Ellen earlier. It was during your season that Ellen came out on her sitcom and that became like a real cultural moment. And it played into the series where I think Maybe one of the kids had come. I don't know if like you asked a kid. I don't I actually don't remember the exact. Uh, let me let me say this again. I think one of the kids had said that their parent wasn't going to let them watch the show anymore. And they have you reacting to that. Yes. How was this? Like, how did you feel like in the moment? Like, what was what didn't we see? Like, what was going on? it made me very sad. And it reminded me of the future struggles that I was going to have to have as a person coming out of the closet and or anybody, any of us coming out of the closet where we saw, or I saw at that moment firsthand that kids are being taught to hate gay people, you know, and I had never, I knew it. I had just never seen it, I guess, in action in front of me before. And the little girl, Jessica is her name. She's just the cutest, sweetest little thing. And I didn't know what to say. And fortunately, Camila knew exactly what to say. You know, she ended up jumping in and saying, I know somebody that, you know, is gay and you like them a lot. <laughs> you know, she, I just, poor thing. I just, I was sometimes, I had, she's one I would love to know if she ever looks back at that clip as a kid. And just, I just wonder what her thought process is now, you know, seeing that. Um, and we got in trouble for that too, or Camila did. What do you mean? Of, what do you mean like, got in trouble? Like she, we... I was in the bathroom crying most of the time, so I didn't have much to say, but I think Camila chiming in, and I guess maybe just, how do I phrase this? Her using it as a teaching moment for the little girl didn't really fly with some of the staff members at the after school program in terms of contradicting anything that she was being taught by her parents at the time. Um, I think maybe that's where I was going with that. So. I mean, she didn't technically get into trouble, but there was a conversation that had that happened at the end of that day in terms of what was said, what wasn't said, what was potentially the little girl going to go back and tell her parents because they knew the parents were probably going to end up coming down or calling, wanting to know what's going on. You know, so there was lots of uh, politics and red tape around that conversation. How did you react to the culture and television so quickly changing thereafter with Will and Grace and then we had Queers Folk and the L Word? Like, were you fans of these things? And how were you just like, what was your reaction to the landscape so rapidly changing? I think it was amazing. I was a huge fan of Queers Folk. Huge, huge, huge. Um, the L Word I loved too. Uh, there are a couple of the storylines. No, go deeper on that. <laughs> I could talk about this all day. <laughs> like, there was so much of the L word where I was having uh, conversations with some of my friends. I'm like, it's just so unrealistic, the portrayal in the L word. And, but some of my girlfriends are like, no, I know people who are, whose lives are exactly like that. And I'm like, really? Like I, I apparently live under a rock. Like I didn't, you can't be serious. And they're like, no, really? Um, so I had, I struggled. I'm like, see, I thought Queer as Folk was much more realistic in terms of the portrayal 
of gay culture, the L word, not so much. It was more of a Hollywood, I don't even know. I don't even know if I know how to put it into words. Um, tell me like what you really liked in Queer as Folk. Like which characters in each of the shows like or storylines were you like super into? I liked the girls and the, the fact that they were moms, you know, they had uh, the baby together. So I liked watching their relationship. Um, uh, what was his name? The character, the blonde, Justin was his name, his coming out process. And I, I, I really enjoyed his character a lot too. And Hal Sparks, wait, his name's, cause I met him in person at a, a dog rescue event, like after the fact. And I told him I really liked his character in a queer as folk as well. I just can't remember what his character name was. And what about the L word? Like, were there any like characters or storylines that like you actually connected with? I always gravitated toward Bet, but I also have my undergraduate degree in art history. So I liked that part of her character where she was a curator. She worked in a museum. So I really, I jived with that a lot. Other than the fact that her character, I think she's just like cool to begin with. It took a long time for the character of Shane to grow on me. Mm hmm. And I don't know why, because she's amazing and wonderful. And she said, it's such a great character. It just took me a while to finally get on board with that. And I don't even, I don't even know if I can put into words why that would even be. Um, I, I totally agree with you. I, you, see, you know what I'm saying? Like it yeah, took a while. It's because she was very one dimensional at first. And as the series went on, it really showed what a great friend she was. Like she was able to like they, they were let her breathe a little bit. And so you saw her interpersonal relationships with the friends. And so yes. it made her super likable. Yes. Of course, Alice Piazeki is always a funny one. She's very, that character is hysterical and her, oh my God, I, it's so many memes and I'm sure that you've seen them where they take the board where everybody's connected. <laughs> yeah, the, ch the chart. You know? Yeah, the chart. Oh my gosh. And it's so freakishly accurate too. Like what, what, especially in my small town in Mississippi, when I left and see to see so many of my friends all dating each other, when that came out, I'm like, see, that's you guys. Like there's six degrees of separation with everybody. Everybody's been in a relationship with everybody. Everybody's still friends after the fact. Everybody's dating each other's friends. Um, pretty accurate, I would say. Absolutely. The chart, <laughs> the chart is the most accurate. I figure you weren't surprised when Sean Duffy went on to become this Republican district attorney. Like, how? what was your reaction to that? He... Either my memory of this is incorrect, or I do specifically remember when Sean, Sean being in the House always said that his aspiration ultimately is to run for president. So being in politics was always his goal. Like he had always talked about that. So it was not shocking to any of us when he ended up becoming uh, a rep. And as far as I know, he's he's re he retired to order to help uh, Rachel with one of the new kids that they, they just had because she had a couple of health problems, but he's planning on rerunning again uh, next, I think for midterm. So I think next November he's planning. Wow. Yeah. And I remember during the pandemic, Jason had posted a screenshot of all of you, your whole cast on zoom. Like, yes. are you still like, who are you the most in touch with, um, among the cast today? So today we're all, we all have a group uh, chat, go, like a group text going. So we're all in communication with each other all the time with the exception of Sean. He's the only one that is not part of our group. Is there a reason why? <laughs> because we originally had all seven of us on the group chat and he was just never responding. Like he just wasn't chiming into a lot of the conversations. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we just got to a certain point where we felt like we were probably blowing up his phone too much. You know, because sometimes I look down and I'll see I got 27 messages all from everybody having conversations with each other. So we just figured we would do him a favor and restart a whole nother uh, thread that doesn't include him. But the rest of the six of us are pretty close knit. Like, I feel like I scored in the roommate department when it comes to everybody and how well we all get along with each other. Um, so you know, Jason and Cyrus and Montana live here in LA and Elka used to live here in LA too. So for a while, I would say for years, Elka and I actually were the closest mm. because we used to occasionally like go out to dinner and hang out and stuff like that until she ended up moving uh, to Texas a few years ago. And then 
Camila is just very busy all the time because, you know, she's an OBGYN in yes. New York. Uh, she's just constantly working, working, working. So, but she chimes in a lot sometimes on our group thread. Um, it just makes the occasional joke. So the six of us get along great. Um, Sean is just different. You know, we got, you got six liberal Democrats and then you've got their, not just the Republican, you've got the Republican politician, you know, so he's just separated from us, unfortunately, in that respect. So you get out of the house and now the show starts airing. What was the reaction, your friends and family and also the general public? Like, how did your life change once this thing was airing on MTV? It was a mixed bag, I have to say. Like some, some people didn't think that I was actually gay. They thought that I was straight and I was just either lying to be on the show. They didn't think that reality TV was actually reality TV. They thought it was a scripted character. So they didn't think that it was actually me being portrayed. Then there were other people who through the gay community just like loved it, loved it, loved it. Uh, everybody was really into it. And then you'd have this whole other sector over here where I was, I was single when I came off the show and I was not, I was having a hard time dating because there were a lot of gay women that didn't think I was a real true gay woman. And we're, it wasn't, it wasn't a good response, I guess is what I'm saying. Why didn't they think that you were really gay? I don't, I guess maybe I vaguely remember the way I was portray, portrayed on the show in this one particular episode, episode that was very drag queen driven in terms of me being very open about just, you know, being attracted to different things or uh, being open-minded about certain things. I don't, I guess that got read by some people, few, few, most people was great, but by a few who just thought that that, that I was really straight and I was trying to be gay, but I wasn't actually gay. And that I was gonna end up being with, I guess a man later down the road. So a lot of women who otherwise would have been interested in like hanging out or going on a date or, you know, exploring a relationship thought that they were looking down the road and thinking, no, this is probably not going to be a good fit for them. So. Wow. I had that problem. They're like, so you really are gay. I'm like, what? I can't even fathom thinking about dating a man unless he's dressed like a woman. How much gayer does that get? Like, come on. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so I think the process of coming out was constant, you know, just constant, 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 trying to have to explain to everybody or try to, you know, answer everybody's questions so everybody's comfort levels were good. But I think that the, the most negative response I got were from other gay women, I have to say. Yeah. Wow. I know you, you said that, I think you had um, a mutual dancer friend um, of Britney Spears and Brittany had watched your season and like was aware of who you were oh yes yes my friend Bernard the the um the drag queen cherry that I was friends with in Boston that I ended up living with in Florida he's a professional dancer and so one of his friends was one of Britney Spears uh backup dancers for years and years and years and because she is born and she's from Mississippi so Bernard just like oh two Mississippi girls you know blah 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 blah, blah. Mm -hmm. so he ended up asking her yeah and it turns out that she she watches the show. She, mean, you know, I'm sure she watches a lot of stuff on MTV at the time. And she was aware yeah, of who I was, which I thought was fun. I love that. I love that for both of you. Um, so you know how they're doing like the real world homecoming now? Like they, they reunited the New York cast yeah. and yeah. they already filmed, I believe, the Los Angeles cast. They're going to be doing New Orleans following that. They're eventually, yeah. I guess, going to come to you guys. Would you do it? We've already been contacted. Yeah, we were contacted. I think what they did is they contacted a lot of different casts at the same time just to put their feelers out. So we all got contacted and everybody is on board except for Sean. He doesn't want to have any part of it. Um, so I think that's why they're going to end up or they're obviously if they're going from L.A. to New Orleans. They're not going to be doing the casts in chronological order because they're having to film it, the cast who's going to have the most participants in it and so new orleans which was a fun season to begin with i think they were lucky in that every single person i think agreed to be part of the reunion show whereas we're going to be missing sean if they ever do us and there are a couple of other casts where i think hawaii i vaguely remember amaya saying that they were two cast members that didn't want to participate in the end 
but by and large, most of us want to do it. Like, I'm like, yeah, man, I'd be totally uh, get to go back to Boston for a couple of weeks and hang out with everybody. It sounds like a party to me. I'm totally into it. But, you know, Sean's a politician and he has to worry about perception, portrayal, you know, things like that that might affect his campaign. So he's just sort of not having anything to do with it. <laughs>